Good morning. We welcome you to Cornerstone Baptist. It is September 10th. School is well into motion. Or at least the calendar says school is in motion. The question that we have this morning is what does a dedicated follower of Jesus look like? And Jesus is going to be showing us that as the morning goes on from Luke chapter 9. Our passage this morning marks a totally new direction that the Gospel of Luke is taking. If, if you have lost one of your blue sheets, there's more in the back. I would encourage you to keep them in your Bible, it, kind of the outline of the Gospel of Luke. But this in verse 51 of Luke 9 is one of the major section breaks. Up until this point, up until chapter 9, verse 50, Luke has been saying, the Messiah is here, he's come, come and see him. But then in chapter 9, verse 51, it says it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to Jerusalem. So from here on out in the Gospel of Luke, Luke is saying, look where the Messiah is going. He's going to the cross. Who is going to follow him? So, so here's the Messiah. He's come. Look at him. Come meet him. The Messiah is going to the cross. Who's going to follow him there? And we've been hint, getting hints of that already, where Jesus has said, if you're going to follow me, take up your cross, follow me. But then this verse is when he specifically, intentionally aims towards Jerusalem, aiming to his time of death. And then the question is, if we are going to follow him, what will that look like? And we will see several different illustrations of that here at the end of Luke chapter 9. Let's take our hymnals. We'll sing about our Savior. Hymn number 35. Hymn number 35, Worship the Lord. 35, Worship the Lord. Let's stand as we sing this. Standing. 
reading, number 28. Number 28, we worship him for his greatness. <clears throat> show your greatness in so many different ways in our own lives, your provision for us, through nature, through the power of nature, sometimes destructive, always, always showing your greatness and your power. Thank you for taking dirt and water and making food. Thank you for so many different ways that you show your goodness to us. Help us to worship you this week. Help us to have our focus on you and not to have it become fuzzy as we look at other stuff in our own activities, our own desires. I pray that this morning, as we listen to Jesus' answers to some of the people that come to him and talk to him, I pray that we would listen to him and our focus would be on following him in him alone. I pray for those who cannot be with us this morning, and some of them are sick, some of them are traveling. I pray that you would show your presence to them, encourage them with that presence. I pray as we each seek to live for you this week, help us to display your character and the changes you're making in our lives, and help us to take the gospel with us and be ready to share it to those in need around us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So a few announcements. Uh, we will have small groups this afternoon. 
the ladies group will not be meeting. Betsy is sick today, but we will be having the small group study on communication. Saturday, there will be a ladies prayer meeting there at Kavanaugh's, the normal one that you have at eight o'clock. So ladies, you're welcome to attend that. I would ask you to prepare your hearts for next Sunday. We have a young missionary couple raising their support to be working in Spanish translation ministries that will be with us. And they would love for us to commit to praying for them throughout their lives. And we will be learning about their ministry next week. I, a couple items relating to that. I would encourage you to be here for the Sunday school hour. That is when they are presenting their ministry itself. Marco, um, Hispanic, will be preaching for us in the morning service. Uh, you can understand him if you pay attention. And I'm glad that God uses people from every language and tongue and is calling a people to himself. Then I would ask you also to bring a dish to share, and we'll be having lunch together downstairs with the missionaries at noon next week. See other announcements there. would we'll just encourage you to refresh your memories relating to that. An update on the Uruguay trip. Please continue to pray for that. Pray for the preparations. One big answer to prayer this week, a decision has been made about the materials to be used and, the, and how the methods to be used. And we're going to be doing things the Uruguay way. So we won't be taking materials to, to be working with. That is an answer to prayer. That clarifies what we need to be collecting and taking and, and, and what work the men have to be prepared to do, you know, what, what the methods are going to be. So thank you for praying. Continue praying. There's a lot more things to go relating to the trip. Some more money coming in, and we praise the Lord for that. But if you would like to give towards the trip, make sure it's marked clearly, uh, missions trip or your going trip, something like that. Calendar in the back has we, is where we sign up for church cleaning. So you would encourage you to at least consider that once in a while to, to serve each other by cleaning the church for each other, cleaning each other's mess. There are blanks on the calendar. Also church mowing, it could use mowing a time or two more this fall. So I encourage you to sign up for that. Other questions or announcements, anything we're missing? Our missionaries this week are Travis and Becky Gravely. Travis is the Church Relations Director of Baptist Fit Missions, as well as the Recruitment and Enlistment Director. Basically, Travis's job is primarily, he does communicate with churches like ours, but his primary job is to connect with people who are interested in missions and this may be at Bible colleges, this may be in churches that he visits, they, this may be phone calls or emails that he gets, and then he connects with them and sees if they are truly, if their church is behind them and with, and with them and saying, yes, we recognize God's call on this person's life. Um, is this person qualified to be a missionary? Would baptism missions be the best mission for this missionary to work with or maybe a different mission board and then to work them through the application process the acceptance process the training process raising of financial support so for instance the missionaries next week Travis gave them our name to call and, and so he has to help them through that process and then the, the day they leave for the field is when Travis says I'm done Praise the Lord, I've done my job. So, so Travis has a big job and, and appreciate his faithfulness in that. Our sister church this week is First Baptist of Raleigh, Massachusetts. 
That church has been there 200 years in Romley. And praise the Lord for God's faithfulness in working through them through that time. And God is still working through that church now. And we appreciate God's work. We're going to pray for both the Gravelies and for First Baptist in Romley. Men, yes, Randy. Um, Anna is getting ready to start her Stranger on the Road to Emmaus small group mm -hmm. for ladies. And uh, there's possibly two already. It's going to be on Monday evenings. We're not sure of the date yet, right? Which, but keep that in mind because other 20 or 30 year old, that age range, okay. Okay, just female, any age. And, uh, and I think. It's going to be at Hannah's home, so we'd like to, Hannah okay. would like to have it be. So we as a church have been through Stranger on the Road to Emmaus before together. It is a marvelous tool to, to train new people in what, what is the, just the course of the Bible? What is the theme of the Bible? But then it's also a marvelous evangelism tool to start people with what is the Bible, what did God do when he created the earth? What has God done since then? And Hannah is going to be starting a group on Monday evenings. And for ladies, if you would be interested in inviting a friend, maybe an unsafe friend to come and attend, um, would in encourage you to see Hannah about that. Now, if we get over, say, eight or so, that's probably about the limit. Then we'll split. Wouldn't that be a great problem to have? To, to have two evangelism groups going on at the same time. So and anyway, if you're interested, see Hannah, and it, it would be a marvelous chance for you to have an unsaved friend that you could go and, and support as you go through the Bible together. Okay, thank you. Okay, ushers come, please. <clears throat> Father, we often question your ability to save people. We've shared the gospel. We've seen their hard hearts. We've seen them reject you. And we think, well, maybe, maybe just maybe God isn't powerful enough. We know you're powerful enough. Thank you for opportunities we have to share the gospel. I pray that we would have compassion on people that don't know Christ, that we would have the passion to then share the gospel with them. Thank you for the opportunities you give us week after week. I pray for our missionary families, especially this week, the Gravelies, as they are involved in their own community, sharing the gospel, as they are making disciples in their church, in their own children, in their community, and then for Travis's job as enlistment director and helping people to become missionaries, and I pray that you would help him to be effective in that work. Thank you for sister churches that we can fellowship with and join with in sharing the gospel. I pray for First Baptist Church in Rowley. Thank you for where you have them right now, and thank you for the work you're doing through them. And we ask your blessing on their worship this morning and on their service this week. We ask, Father, for this offering, that you would bless it, that you would encourage each one of us in our faith as we give out of faith and trust you to do what's best with, um, with our offerings. I pray for our Uruguay trip coming up, that you would be faithful in the pre preparations of that and in, in the health and so many other things that have to go right for this team to be a success for you. I pray that above all that they would be a success by reflecting your character and love to the people around them throughout the trip. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Gospel of Luke chapter 9 is where we're going to go for our scripture reading. Gospel of Luke chapter 9. As we read, if you have a red letter Bible, you will see that it goes back and forth between describing a situation or giving some dialogue of people and then Jesus responds. If you don't have red letter, you can notice that where it's fairly clear when Jesus speaks. But just notice the, the back and forth as we're reading, starting in Luke 9, verse 46. It says, Then there arose a reasoning among them, which of them should be greatest? And Jesus, perceiving the thought of their hearts, took a child and set him by him. And he said unto them, Whosoever shall receive this child in my name receives me. Whosoever shall receive me receives him that sent me. He that is least among you all, the same shall be great. And John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name. We forbid him because he follows not with us. And Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. And it came to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem, and sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him, because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even like Elijah did? And he turned and rebuked them and said, You know not what manner of spirit you are of, for the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. And it came to pass... That as he went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said to him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. These are hard verses. They're hard verses to read, but even harder to then apply to our lives. Because I don't know about you, I kind of kick back a little bit against them. But when we kick back against them, we're kicking back against Jesus himself, the God of the universe. And that's not a very smart thing to do. Uh, so hopefully we can learn from this this morning as we seek to apply these things to our lives. I'm calling them features of a disciple, of a follower of Christ. What is a follower of Christ like? First, let's sing some more hymn number 40. Hymn number 40. You can remain seated for this first song, and then we'll stand for the second one just to stretch a little bit. Hymn number 40. to stand. We'll have to stand and make it up as we go. <laughs> um, you will recognize the tune. You recognize that? Um, I'm sure you've heard it before. <laughs> Jesus our Lord and King our praises rise Show 
Chapter 9. Jesus the Messiah is going to the cross. Who wants to follow him? Who wants to go with him? And then what would somebody who goes with him look like? What would be some of the features that we'd look for in their lives? Sometimes people make a list of their own about what these people might look like. Oh, well, they go to church so many times a week, or they read their Bible 20 minutes every day, or, or sometimes we even go into more you might even say character traits or personality traits. Well, a follower of Jesus has to have the gift of gab. They have to be able to go up to anybody on the street and start a conversation with them. And boy, I don't know about you, I, I flunked that one. Um, others would be saying something like, well, they have, can't have any traffic tickets. They can't have any bad habits. Uh, they can't. Um, chew with their mouth open. They, they, you, you know, um, those would be horrible things to do. Um, they can't have skeletons in the closet. Um, they have to be good administrators. They have to have their lives always under control. Their their kitchen table can't have stuff on it. You know, um, you know all of those things. Um, it's interesting, other people actually go the other direction and they refuse to make any lists. That would be legalism. Well, let me just ask you if you've read Luke 9 this past month as we've been preaching through it and ask yourself, does Jesus make any demands of us? So did that make Jesus a legalist? No, he, he just wanted people to follow him. And he wants us to follow him. What would Jesus' followers look like? It's interesting that the 12 apostles looked very differently from each other. There was Simon the Zealot, you know, the guy with a sword in his hand who, who, who was a, a rebel, a, a governmental rebel. Then there was somebody who worked for the government, Matthew, the tax collector. Then there were businessmen who owned their own fishing businesses, working with their hands. And, and if you've worked with ropes and, 
and nets, imagine the calluses on their hands. And they were different in their personalities. Today, we, we see James and John calling, do you want us to call down fire? Let's just consume them. And then Jesus called them the sons of thunder. They, they were just obnoxious in how loud and boisterous they were. But they were all different, and Jesus uses different people. But there are certain things that are consistent among Jesus' followers, and that's what we're trying to observe here in Luke 9 this morning. Look at verse 40. Again, going back and forth with what is going on, and then Jesus' response. In verse 40, the disciples couldn't cast out the demon. In verse 41, Jesus responds, you faithless generation. You need to trust me in order for this to happen. But then in verse 43, everybody's amazed at what happens. In verse 44, Jesus responds to his disciples. Get this through your thick head. Um, let, let this sink into your ears. I'm, I have to go die. And then in verse 46, the disciples are arguing over who was the greatest. And Jesus, in verse 47, 48, takes this child as an object lesson. Takes Elsie, <laughs> and, and, and says, you think you're important. Look at the child. That's where we're going to pick up this morning. Christ's followers feature humility. You think you're so great, huh? Well, take a look at the child here. Well, what was the argument? Verse 46, there arose an argument, a reasoning among them. Notice that they were reasoning about it, giving reasons why they were more important than the next person. Isn't that amazing? Where they're, they're actually thinking it through and reasoning it out, who's going to be the greatest. I, I would encourage you, to keep reading ahead in the Gospel of Luke. Um, next week is missionaries, but the week after will be chapter 10. But I would also encourage you to read, looking, following the cross references. And then if you have a Harmony of the Gospels, use that. Because it, it, a Harmony of the Gospels just lays out each Gospel right next to each other. And there will be one section of one Gospel that says it, and then the next one says very similar things. Or there'll be a gap. Some Gospels cover things the other Gospels don't. Well, Mark deals with this as well. But in the Mark account, Mark 9.33, it, it describes they're along the way. They're, they're traveling along the pathway. And they get to the, where they're going. And Jesus asks them, what was it you guys were talking about? So, so there's a distance between Jesus and them as they're walking. Think, think about that. The further away you are from Jesus, often the more trouble we have with pride. And Jesus says, what are you arguing about? What was it you were arguing about? Well, verse 44, notice the disconnect they had. They had just heard Second time for all of them, it just heard that Jesus had to go and die. And here they are arguing about how great they are. It just, verse 45, they didn't even understand the saying. This also is a great lesson for us. Not only the further are we from Jesus, the more pride we tend to have, but the, the more we remember the cross, the more humble we become. The more we remember what Jesus did for us, the more pride kind of takes a back seat to our lives. So what is Jesus' response? Well, Jesus' solution to them is childlike humility. If you're going to brag, if you're going to boast, if you're going to argue about how great you are, here's my solution. Take a child in, in your arms and, and hold that child a while and become like that child. Uh, 
the, again, the other passages talk about Jesus not only bringing the child to himself, um, verse 47, but actually taking the child in his arms. And Jesus wasn't afraid to do that. Jesus wasn't afraid to humble himself and have a diaper leak or whatever it is that you might have happen when a baby is in your arms. But Jesus says, you really want to be great, huh? Verse 48, whoever will receive this child in my name receives me. Whoever receives me receives him to send me, who sent him the Father. For he that is least among you the same shall be great. Jesus says this a bunch of different ways throughout the Gospels. You want to be great, you take a low position. When you go into a meal, don't go to the first table. You stay at the back table. And then if they want to invite you higher, that's great. But if they don't want to invite you higher, and you're already up there, that's pretty embarrassing to be put in your place. I know I've been put in my place many times. Receive children, welcome children, value children. Children are great, Jesus says. And sometimes we miss that. Pride destroys our ministries for Jesus and keeps us from following Jesus. I'm so important that I have to work instead of following Jesus. So we'll work 80 hours a week. Now, are there times when Jesus wants us to work 80 hours a week? Yeah, that happens. But make sure it's because he's leading you into it and you go there humbly, not bragging about how great you are. But it, it destroys our pride to have a child in front of us or be holding a child and to be valuing the child and to be serving the child in God's name. It destroys our pride because we understand that our standing before God is not based on what we do. That child can do nothing for you except maybe smile in, in response to your, oh, isn't this so cute? <laughs> and our standing before God is not based on whether we can make him smile or not. Our standing before God is based on how we respond to Christ dying in our place. We trust in him. But it also destroys our pride by saying, Christ wants us to serve people, not because of what they can do for us, not because of what we get out of it, not how they can pad our resume. Not, well, in my application for this job, I'm gonna put down how many hours of community service I do because I've served at church and who cares? Serve Jesus, love him, whether you can put it on your resume or not, whether anybody ever finds out about it or not. You moms especially know this. Many people don't see what you put in to your kids. And that's what we're learning from Jesus, that a follower of Jesus is humble. Second, we see, and, and again, we're just going back and forth here. Verse 49, Jesus answered, and uh, John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name. We, we forbid him because he doesn't follow with us. And Jesus said, forbid him not. He that is not against us is is for us. So Christ's followers feature grace. So we feature humility. Christ's followers feature grace or graciousness. Their concern is, he's not one of the 12. He's, he's not one of us. You gave us power and authority to cast out demons. They, they, you didn't give them authority and power. He says, how do you know? Just because he, they weren't, he wasn't with us when I gave you the power and authority. Who says they don't? The disciple's solution to that was to make him stop. And Jesus' solution is, 
to lighten up. Don't take it so seriously here. Jesus can use people that are different than we are. As I mentioned last week, there's a month of teaching about who to cooperate with, who to separate from. Somebody could say very easily, I love Jesus, but then anything that Jesus says, they would deny. They deny scripture and we'd say, we can't cooperate with them. But that's not the point here. If, if, if that was the point here, Jesus would have said, you're absolutely right. He, he is worshiping a false god in my name. But instead he says, no, he, he's, he's doing the same thing that we're doing. And he's doing so with my blessing. Don't stop him. People can be different from us and not be in the same little group that we're in. Let him serve. So again, kind of minimizing the, the separation arguments about who to cooperate with or not. Those are important discussions to have. Jesus' point here to the apostles is, show grace to those that are serving Christ. Don't be territorial. Don't be, don't be isolationists. Don't be ones like Elijah saying, I'm the only one serving you, God. And, and, and God says to Elijah, look, I, I've got hundreds more that you don't know about. So then verse 51, as I mentioned earlier, is this big hinge between the sections, between major sections in Luke up to this point. It's been organized around introducing the Messiah. Here he is. Take a look. Here's who he is and what he's like. And then from here on up until chapter 19, somewhere in the middle of chapter 19, we will see Jesus heading purposely to Jerusalem to die. Who's going to follow him there? What it would it be like to follow him? Luke 23 I mean, Luke 9, verse 23, I'm sorry, Luke 9, 23. Here's what a follower would be like. They would carry their own instrument of death. They would be dying to self. They'd be living for Jesus alone. Verse 44, they would be letting it sink into their ears that Jesus is going to die for them. That's why Jesus came. Verse 46, 47, 48, they would have to set aside their personal ambitions they would have to set aside their desire for some big position somewhere, and they would have to humbly serve Jesus. This is 49 and 50. They would have to be gracious as they observe others serving Jesus. Maybe they're doing it a little bit differently. That doesn't mean they're doing it wrong or serving somebody other than Jesus. And then in verse, 40, verse 51, I'm sorry, on through verse 56, question comes, what about unbelievers who stand in the way of Jesus or who will not help Jesus? Jesus sends uh, um, representatives ahead to, say, reserve motel rooms, for lack of a better term, to, to, to organize supper. There, there seems to be a, a fair group here traveling with them. In fact, chapter 10, verse 1, there's 70 that are going to be assigned and sent out to preach. Is that a different situation, different circumstance? It could be, but, but they could be included in this group. And you don't just show up in town and expect to be fed and expect to have a place to stay. So he sends people ahead to, to arrange something. And the Samaritans, nah, we don't have a place for you. We don't serve your type. So how do we respond to them? How do we respond to people like that? What if, what if the town of Jay decided, you know what? We just lost the mill and we need some tax revenue here. And in order to get tax revenue, because the churches use town roads and town services, the fire department serves them the same as anybody else. So we're going to start taxing churches for their property. What if a town does that? 
So what, right? We use the town services just like anybody else. Now, if they're, if they're picking out one church at the expense of another, that's a different story. But the Samaritans weren't going to help Jesus. How does Jesus respond to that? Christ's followers feature mercy, not just humility, not just graciousness, but mercy. So 51, 52, 53, they go in town. They didn't receive, notice verse 53, they didn't receive him. Well, I thought, I thought that Jesus sent others ahead. Why did they say they didn't receive him? Because they were Jesus' representatives. They, they were representing Jesus. Jesus said, this is the king coming into town saying, I'd like to arrange a place. And they say, sorry, no place. A few weeks from now, the Northeast Regular Baptist Fellowship of Churches is having a conference in Harrington, Maine. Some of you don't even know where Harrington, Maine is. That's how far out of the way it is. There is one little place to stay in town. You, you have to plan ahead. Well, Jesus was planning ahead. And they said, no, we're not going to serve you. So how do you respond to that? Verse 54, the disciples' solution was, hey, let's call down fire from heaven. Notice again who it is, James and John, the sons of thunder. At least give them credit for this. They ask first. <laughs> but isn't it interesting that the disciple, again, James and John could claim that it wasn't them that couldn't cast out the demon back just a few verses earlier. But isn't it interesting, they couldn't cast out a demon, but yet they think they can call down fire. It, you know, giving themselves maybe more credit than they deserve. So what does Jesus think about their solution? Look, they didn't, they're not gonna help us. They're not even, we had money to pay for a place to stay tonight, and they're not even gonna help us with that. I, I think they deserve to be just wiped off the face of the earth. Jesus rebukes them, verse 55. He, he looks straight at James and John, and he rebukes them for that attitude. You don't know what manner of spirit you are. Have you ever had a conversation with somebody, your spouse, your kids, somebody at church? And then you got thinking back later, and you said, wow, that might not have gone the way I meant it. Well, why didn't it go the way we meant it? Often because we meant it. Often because our spirit was nasty. Our spirit was hateful. Our spirit was selfish. You don't even know your own hard attitudes. You, you, you've got to understand mercy has this attitude of love and understanding understanding that the Samaritans were brought up that way. They were brought up saying, we have our place of worship. Remember the woman at the well? We worship here. You guys worship in Jerusalem. We're different than you. The Samaritans that were looked at as rejects by the Jews because they were half-breeds. They, they were, this is way back in Assyria. You have to go way back in history where Assyria sends some of the Jews back to intermingle with their own people and be not purebred Jews, you might say. And Jews thought that was horrible, so they didn't want anything to do. I think, I, I don't know, I think some of the racial mess that we have here in America. Many people, many people are not prejudiced, but then there's some stirring the pot just trying to get people upset. And, and that's how Samaritans were trained. We don't deal with Jews. When Jews come through, just leave them alone and let them go. And Jesus says, you guys, you, you don't have an attitude of love and understanding. Mercy has this attitude. Mercy also wants to save lives, not destroy them. Verse 56, the Son of Man didn't come to destroy men's lives, 
but to save them. That's why Jesus is headed to Jerusalem, is to save lives through his own death. How does mercy respond? End of verse 56, so they went to another village. Do you ever feel like you just have to make somebody pay for their wrong? Maybe it's, maybe it's the dealership that kind of didn't want to help you with your car. Maybe it's a family member, maybe it's somebody else. But you find yourself upset at those who will stand in your way. You are on a mission and they dare to say, I'm not gonna help you with that. That's not really what I'm here to do. How do you respond? I'm gonna make you pay. Now mercy requires that we love them and have this attitude of saving their lives, not destroying them. Now I, I will mention this, mercy actually requires us receiving mercy ourselves. We have to receive Christ's mercy by trusting Christ as our Savior. Have you trusted him? Are you responding to him in faith? And then mercy remembers what Jesus did for us. And then mercy responds by pointing others to Jesus. To, to say, as they leave town, verse 56, going to this other village, and we'll see this in two weeks in chapter 10, that as you leave town, as you go to the next village, you say, no, you just missed an opportunity to have a relationship with the king. You don't know what you're missing. But you're not making them pay. And that's Jesus' point, mercy. So Jesus' renovation, I'm gonna just mention this briefly. James and John, what did they turn into? John wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. What is John talking about through those letters? Love, love, love. Oh, it's so sweet. And, and, and I'm thinking, what had to happen between, let's, let's call it on fire, to, you know, I have no greater joy than to see my children walking together in truth and loving each other and living that out with each other. Well, Jesus had to intervene, and, and he actually changed their lives, and he can change ours, too. He can change mine, too. The chapter doesn't end the way we might like it to end. Uh, these are hard verses. I, I, I beg you, don't, don't just pass over them. Don't just pass over areas of scripture that you don't like. Don't expect pastor to pass over passages that we don't like. We've got to deal with it. We've got to look at, look at the situation. We've got to look at Jesus' response and say, Jesus meant something by these things. What did he mean? I think the overall umbrella, the, the primary point of verses 57 through 62 are that of Christ's followers are going to feature pinpoint focus. There's going to be one thing important to you in life, one thing, and that is following Jesus. Does that make these other things unimportant? No. But the, what's going to focus, be the focus of your life is going to be Jesus himself. And, and we, we can all look at each other's lives and, and we can live pretty crooked lives because we're chasing this and chasing that and chasing the other. We're, we're like the dog track, you know, that, that has to check this and check that and check the other. On the farm, we had an Irish setter who would run with us every time we would say, say we we're putting in silage. So you'd go 30 loads a day, half a mile, pick up the wagon, come back half a mile, unload. Go back half a mile, pick up the next wagon, come back half a mile. That dog would go all day long chasing us, but it wasn't straight half a mile. He put in a, a mile or two for every half a mile we put in because he had to check this out and he had to check that out. He had his, everything that he went to 
And, and I think some of us tire ourselves out because we don't have a pinpoint focus. We claim to be, or we try to, to make it look like we're following Jesus, but yet we're following something else. Verse 57, a certain man said, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. What do you think? Is, is that a good thing to say? I, I, it seems like it, right? Matthew explains that this man is a scribe. Remember, Matthew was writing to Jews who would understand these things. The scribes had rejected Christ consistently, and they're going to be the ones kind of working together to try to kill Christ. So wouldn't this be a good thing for a scribe to come and say, I'm going to follow you anywhere you're going to go, Lord. Well, this man seems to have had different expectations than Jesus had. So Jesus says, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, the Son of Man doesn't have anywhere to put his head, I don't have anywhere to sleep. Well, if you think back just a few verses, look, they just kicked us out of the city of Samaria, we didn't, they weren't gonna offer us a place to stay. That's what you're gonna be up against. What were the scribes expecting? They were expecting a king who was gonna overthrow Rome, who was gonna give them everything. Everything's free. You know, the king's going to give us everything that we ever need. Well, I think we can learn from verse 57, 58 is that we should focus on following Christ, not on our comforts. This man seems to have been, Jesus, remember, we're not Jesus. Okay, so when somebody comes to say, I'm going to follow Jesus wherever, we probably shouldn't try to read their minds. We could warn them and say, you know, it might not be all it's cracked up to be, all that you think it's, it's all about. It's not your best life now. There is heaven in the future. But, well, following me, Jesus is saying, may actually bring a lot of sacrifice to your life. Do you ever know somebody who, said, who complains about how hard life is? Jesus says, life is hard for me too. And if you follow me, there's probably going to be more hard life ahead. <clears throat> and we would be people doing people a disservice if we think, make them think that Jesus is going to make their life all better with no discomfort at all. Their schedules will most likely be changed if they follow Christ. Their fortunes may be changed if they follow Christ. What about verse 59? Jesus says to another, follow me. So the first one came and volunteered. I'm going to follow you. The second one, Jesus is recruiting, follow me. And the man answers, Lord, allow me to go bury my father first. Does that sound reasonable? Yeah, probably. But what's going on in this man's heart and life? What's up with Jesus' answer? Let the dead bury their dead. You go and preach the kingdom of God. That sounds really harsh. Look, my dad's lying there in the coffin. Let me go and bury him first. That, that sounds pretty harsh. Well, it, what we can say is at the least, Jesus has to take priority over every human relationship. At the very least, we have to say that. Follow, focus on following Christ, not on your family. There are so many people that claim to follow Christ, but their focus is their family. If there's, if there's a regularly scheduled series of events that, that, would, that would narrowly represent following Christ, and a family event comes up, what will come first? The narrowly scheduled events that say 10 years from now, most likely Cornerstone Baptist Church will be having a 1045 morning service. We already know that. That's regularly scheduled. But family then supersedes 
ready. Why don't we just say, I'll be there at two this afternoon? Why can't we say that? In love for our family, or why don't you come to church with me first at 1045 and then let's go and have our family get together this afternoon? What seems to be going on in this man's life is family first, Christ second. When I'm done with my family, then I'll follow you, Lord. I think there may be actually more going on here than that. Um, burying a dead relative, is that a godly thing to do? Taking care of? Sure. Um, many people think that most likely this man's dad wasn't dead yet. In fact, even today in the Middle East, this is one of those sayings, almost like when pigs fly. Okay. Would you come help me with this? No, I gotta go bury dad first. In other words, they're blowing you off. Um, is that what's going on here? I don't know. But we cannot label Jesus as harsh the most loving person who ever lived, came from heaven. He left heaven because of his love for us. We can't say that he's being harsh here. So focus on following Christ, not family. What about, look, my dad's, if you were to carry this through, okay, my dad's not dead yet. What if we were to carry through, my dad needs my care. Is that a godly thing to do, to care for ailing, aging parents? Yeah. Jesus, what is Jesus' point? No matter what scenario you come up with for what verse 59 means, what does Jesus mean in verse 60? Let the dead spiritually bury their own dead you follow me. You go and preach the kingdom of God. There's something more important than doing what your family is telling you to do or what your family expects from you. Following Christ requires undivided attention. Don't lose your focus. Follow Christ. Well, what about 61 and 62? Verse 61, another said, I'll follow you. So here we have another volunteer. But let me first go bid them farewell which are at home at my house. Jesus said to him, no man having put his hand to the plow, looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Again, what is this all about? I think we could say that this could be focus on following Christ, not on your past relationships, your past companions. You could invite them to come with you, but Jesus probably is reading this man's heart and saying, if you go back and get sucked into that again, you will never follow me. I'm going to follow you, but I've got to go back first. Let me first go back and bid them farewell. Interesting. Let me first, let me first, me first, me first. Um, think about that relating to the decisions we make in life. How often we say, me first, my agenda first, then I'll follow you, Christ. Probably Jesus knew that they would distract him, that they would suck him dry, they would suck his passion for Christ dry, and that he would then have his relationship with Christ affected by his former friends. We use this excuse, but, but Jesus, I'm just trying to win them for you. Um, I've given this illustration before, you know, you come up to the side of the stage and is it easier to pull somebody up or for them to pull me down? You say you are trying to win them for Christ. What are the results of that? that that's one good way to tell whether we're following Christ or not. It's whether we are being dragged down away from Christ or whether they are being dragged towards Christ. So focus on following Christ, not on your past companions. Do you invite your friends to come with you? Yes. But don't get, 
don't have your focus looking back. Why? Well, I grew up on the farm. Um, I, I raked hay before I plowed. Those early days were pretty crooked windrows. And there were some times that dad would have to stop me and say, I won't be able to pick that up with a baler. That's way too crooked. How did it get so crooked? Because as a youngster, I was looking all over the place, not in front of me. I had my focus in the wrong place. So Jesus' answer really is very helpful in sharpening our focus. Are you looking ahead? Are you looking back? Are you looking straight to Jesus? Are you looking around you? Are you looking to Jesus and following him only? Or are you taking clues from the people around you and, and, and kind of following in what they expect of you today? Well, if I do that, then my family's gonna be upset at me. Following Jesus requires unwavering commitment and focus. If you're chafing against these verses, you're not alone. Um, please don't take pastor's word for these verses. You fight with Jesus about these verses. You go to Jesus. You listen to Jesus. And you try to understand what he means. I don't see any way of taking Jesus' specific words in any way other than to say, there's a focus on him to the exclusion of everything and everybody else. Not my stuff. The guy who says, let me go bury my father, one of the little side suggestions of that is, look, if I go and help dad for the rest of his life and then he dies, I'll get my inheritance and then I'll be self-supporting to be able to go and serve the Lord for the rest. That, that was suggested to Betsy and I back in the Amway days. You ever get in the Amway situation? Just think, Dan, you're, you're, you're going into missions. Just think, you could just put a little bit of effort in now and then you'd be self-supporting and wouldn't have to worry about anybody else. That wasn't what Amway was about. And most of the people that tried to get us into Amway are not in it anymore because they figured out it's not what Amway was about. And this sermon's not about Amway, sorry. But it's about following Christ wholeheartedly. Because in my mind, I could not honestly say that from that point forward, I would not look at people as a means to get what I wanted to use people, to bring people in at the bottom of the food chain, so to speak, so that I could get where I wanted to get. I felt it was gonna distract me from following Christ. Often our jobs turn into this. We, we aspire to make our way up the ladder, and that's not a bad thing. Please don't take me as saying that's a bad thing. But often it's the expense, at the expense of Christ and following him wholeheartedly. These are hard verses, but be humble, be gracious, be merciful, but be focused. Focus on Jesus in following him alone. Let him take care of the rest. Invite others to go with you, but don't, don't leave the pathway of Christ to go and try to rescue some out of the ditches, lest you be in the ditch too, and, and then you're not following Christ anymore. Let's take our hymnals as we finish up. Hymn number 427. 427. We'll sing just the first verse of this. 427. Jesus, I my cross have taken all to leave and follow thee. Let's stand as we sing. I my cross have taken to leave and follow thee, destitute, despised, forsaken, thou from hence my all shall be, perish every
every fond ambition all I've sought and hoped and known yet how rich is my condition God and heaven are still my own let's bow our heads the next verse says let the world despise and leave me they've left my savior too human hearts and looks deceive me thou art not like man untrue and while thou shalt smile upon me god of wisdom love and might foes may hate and friends may shun me show thy face and all is bright friends we need to trust christ and follow him if you've never trusted Jesus to forgive you, he's headed to the cross in, here in Luke. Now we're looking back on that today as he didn't only die on the cross, but he rose again in power and victory. He's now reigning in heaven at his Father's right hand. And all we have to do is trust him to be forgiven and saved. And believer, are we distracted at times? Do we sometimes act like the world at the same time as claiming to follow Christ. I urge you to reread Luke 9, maybe the whole thing, and just observe what Jesus' followers look like. Father, when we read passages like this and as we try to apply them to our lives, we come to the end of our abilities. We find that we're unable to do the very things that you require. And that's not a bad thing because you promise us all the help we need. So we come now asking you to help us to live for you, to help us to trust you. Trust you not only with what happens in our lives, but trust you with our direction in life. That we wouldn't feel like we're missing something to follow Christ, but that we would follow him wholeheartedly, inviting others to follow, whether they do or not. That's their business. Whether we do or not, that's our business. Help us to live faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.